Welcome everybody. Hello and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I am excited to welcome you to today's program. My name is Tamar Friedman. I'm the Senior Director of Programs here at JFN. And today we have a wonderful opportunity um, in partnership with the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty to have a program on the protective power of community connection. I think we all feel this in different ways, especially during this time um, of COVID in these last few years, couple of years with how important community and connection is. So really um, thrilled that we have the opportunity today to dive into this and how, and its intersection with people that might be dealing with and struggling with, with poverty. And with that, I'm happy to introduce Susan Mohditkoff, our, our moderator for today and for all of our um, sessions um, to get us started today. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, Tamar, and welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Susan Wolf Ditkoff, and as Tamar said, um, I have had the honor of moderating this set of webinars um, for the Jewish Poverty Affinity Group. Um, and I've also um, had the opportunity to uh, prepare and learn with uh, both Carol and Michal, who we'll be hearing from today um, on their really exciting and important research. Um, as many of you know, especially those of you who have been part of our webinar series so far, um, we've taken a few different camera angles um, on poverty in the Jewish community, um, with especially during the, the pandemic. Um, and some of them have been really focused on what funders can do. Do, how funders can may have a unique opportunity to contribute and make a difference. Um, some of them have, we've heard right from people on the front lines, um, frontline workers um, about what they're experiencing. A number of our webinars have gone deep into different sectors. So what's happening with housing, what's happening with food insecurity. Um, and some of our uh, have some of our webinars have featured people who are in, working with special populations such as um, uh, LGBTQ community. So today um, what we do, what we have is a, a, a unique opportunity in the webinar series, which is to learn from two experts whose the center of their work is not necessarily poverty in the Jewish community. In fact, it's much wider um, and they have much broader footprints in the world of social sciences, uh, but each of them is so distinguished in their field and has a set of lessons that's enormously relevant um, to, our, to our topic today. So uh, we'll start with um, Michal Grinstein Weiss. Um, let me just say a few words of introduction. Um, Michal is a distinguished professor um, at the uh, George Warren Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, she also serves as the Associate Dean for Policy Initiatives, I think, um, and it directs a number of other centers um, and has other affiliations, for example, a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Um, and so we're very excited to learn from Michal's research um, that focuses not only on the US, but also Israel um, and, uh, and brings together um, some unique insights for us today. Um, we also are very fortunate to have with us Carol Graham, um, who is the Leo Pavolsky, Pazwalski, um, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Um, she's a professor at the University of Maryland and um, has affiliations at many other institutions such as Gallup um, and others. Um, and she's really done groundbreaking research on um, and findings on well-being and happiness um, and really thinking through a set of ideas that several decades ago was um, was a new idea and was uh, and is now really the well-being metrics um, that she pioneered um, really are routine and they're critical in the broader world of social sciences research. So um, we're going to hear from both of them, um, and then what we'll do is we'll just have a bit of a conversation about which of these pieces are most relevant um, to in the world of Jewish poverty specifically and some ideas that funders um, can particularly take away um, from, from this. Um, along the way, as always, please feel free to put questions into the Q&A and we will make sure that we get to them um, in the second part of the discussion. So with that, um, let me start with Michal, if I can turn it over to you. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Today I'm in Israel, it's a good evening. So I'm delighted to be here today. I'll share now my screen. Um, so you can see my, so I can get my presentation to start. Uh -oh. It's not working in a second. Um, 
I'll try again. Uh, so today I'll, I'll talk about a topic that is really close to my heart, okay? Um, about the, um, how the Jewish community fell during the early stages of the pandemic. So I'm very grateful for the Jewish Founder Network to invite me to speak here today. I'm delighted that I can share this virtual stage with my dear friend and colleague, Carol Graham, um, who will discuss some of her seminal work as it's related to the finding we see in, in the Jewish community. So as I start this webinar, I, am, I want to kind of ask you a question. What do you think the strengths of the Jewish community is? If you can take a moment and put some words in the chat that kind of describe how you feel, how you feel, uh, what's for you the strengths of the Jewish community, that will be great. Uh, I see a few people, free chat, please, um, please, uh, no, free to continue to add more words. For me, when I, um, when I, choose to move from Israel to the US to pursue my PhD. One of the most important thing was uh, when I choose the school was, is there a strong Jewish community close to where I will be living and doing my PhD for four years? And that's turned to be a really, really important factor for me. And uh, as I end up staying in the US, um, I always, that was a really deciding factor of where I live and where I work. Um, so I see a few words, and I think they're all kind of saying the same thing that for me mean togetherness. Um, I feel that the Jewish community is, um, is really taking care of each other, it's sense of family, and uh, that's why that kind of led us to do the research to try to look on how the Jewish community fared during COVID. To do that, we use uh, data that we collected in the Social Policy Institute that was part of a really lo a large longitudinal study that we did during COVID as soon as COVID started. We followed 55,000 households in the US and 2,400 households uh, in Israel um, throughout the pandemic, still going. We completed the four wave, five waves, so interviewed them every three months. And uh, with really the focus on uh, many questions, uh, including what the income loss, how it's that affect families, the cost of childcare, the impact of women in the workforce. In Israel, we went more into vaccination, vaccination hesitancy, effect of uh, anxiety in children, food insecurity, et cetera. Um, because we really wanted to investigate also the experience of Jewish Americans, we also supplement our data for, with a study that was done at Brandeis University that included a survey of 10 Jewish communities across the, the US that were collected at the beginning of the pandemic and, and covered 1,500 uh, households. So comparing the two surveys, we were trying to focus on both the vulnerabilities as well as the strengths of the Jewish American community. Uh, and today we will walk through some of the experiences as they relate to employment, financial hardship, material hardship, along with how being Jewish, how people care um, and cope during the pandemic. So first, let's look on some finding related to employment. So one of the surprising findings when we look at employment was that more Jewish Americans were essential workers compared to the overall US estimate. So 40% of Jewish Americans compared to 33% of the US population. This showed that Jewish, um, Jewish Americans are often more at risk than other groups in the US, both due to increased exposure to illness and increased experience of hardship, like the need to um, take care uh, and finding childcare during school closure when they are still working. Digging deeper, we find that Orthodox Jews and Jews without a bachelor degree are the ones who are most likely to be an essential worker. 
And looking at who experienced jobless, we found that almost two thirds of Jewish American reported higher level of stress uh, due to COVID-19. Overall, we see that parents um, are uh, having higher levels of job stress than non-parents. And within the group of parents, as can be expected, we see that you know, parents of young children, uh, particularly age under the age of five, are most vulnerable to job loss, job stress. Next, we looked at financial and material hardship within the Jewish community. First, we see that compared to the US sample, slightly more Jewish American did not have an emergency savings. In other words, they didn't have enough uh, fund to cover the expenses for three months in case of sickness, job loss, economic downturn, or other emergency. Further analysis showed that a lack of emergency savings particularly, particularly affected young adults, ultra-Orthodox, and those who were unemployed. This has serious implications for those individuals, such as an increased likelihood to miss a bill, experiencing food and housing instability, and increased debt. This is a lot of, there's a lot of research that we've been doing at the Social Policy Institute to look on the effect of um, lack of emergency savings. And uh, this is some of them. I wanna take another moment and ask you another question. Um, who do you think are, uh, uh, will be suffering the most uh, financially, have the most financial concerns um, during, during COVID? Is it parents of zero to five, six to 12, or 13 to 17 years old? Uh, please, again, uh, add your uh, thought in the chat. Um, look, the youngest, six to 12, zero to five, a lot of zero to five, a lot of zero to five. Okay, so about that. So um, we, we are doing a lot of research on the financial hardship of, um, of parents in general for young kids in Israel as well. And we really did see that uh, the, the greatest financial concerns are parents of young children. But we were surprised to see that uh, here that it's actually that it's actually uh, uh, in this sample it was actually uh, of uh, parents of older kids, parents with kids that are 13 to 17 years old. Uh, it might be that it is, you know, that's implied they have larger families with more kids and therefore more financial stress. That might be also implied they're getting closer to colleges and they're more worried. Um, so, you know, like many of you in the chat, we also thought we'll see it more on younger kids because of childcare, uh, but we're seeing it actually greater financial concern uh, for uh, parents with older kids. So at the beginning of the presentation, I ask you what the Jewish community means to you. Now, um, let's look on really the, the, the impact of this. What is this community mean? I use the word um, uh, togetherness. And, uh, and I think it's kind of, you will see that it's coming to that. So, to understand the, the, the strengths of the Jewish American network connection, we define connection as having a close friend or a family member who you could rely on if you needed. And we found that Jewish American who felt connected to a network, especially Jewish network, coped better with the pandemic, socially, emotionally, and financially. So as you see, the Jewish community is relatively strong and 56% uh, said that they have fair amount or many network connections. However, there's still a significant amount, 44% of Jewish American who said they are not connected to others, that they have none or very few um, people they feel connected to. 
This is important because having limited network connection had a negative impact on how well responded were coping with the pandemic. Jewish Americans with fewer connections were more likely to say that they are not coping well with the pandemic and less optimistic about returning to normal life. We also saw that network connections were related to mental health. Those who lack network support were more likely to report loneliness and emotional difficulties than uh, were those with larger network supports. However, the story doesn't end here. When we look specifically on how being Jewish supported individuals, we found that for 59% of Jewish Americans uh, who said that uh, they said that being Jewish helped with managing the impact of the pandemic. This was particularly, particularly prevalent among Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jews, while the effect was not as strong among secular Jews. Being Jewish seemed to particularly help those who reported not having enough money to deal with the impacts of the pandemic, of the 59% who reported uh, that being Jewish helped them cope with the pandemic, this was a highest among, it was highest among those who didn't have enough money prior to the pandemic. So in summary, what set Jewish American apart during this pandemic is the strengths of the Jewish community. The data show that community and connections are our strengths when in crisis, togetherness, my word, I put it uh, earlier. Uh, looking at the data, we see that, uh, sorry, looking at the data, we see that it's amazing that how the Jewish community help make a true difference in this time of financial hardship. However, we need to remember that most of the vulnerable population did not, um, that many of the vulnerable population um, uh, were Orthodox Jews, young adults uh, and parents, and 44% of the Jewish community reported few or no connection. As we continue to recover and rebuild um, what the pandemic took, we must remember our strengths and connections. And we also need to remember who are the vulnerable and keep focusing on them. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for, uh, again, for the Jewish Funder Network for this opportunity to speak and passing it on to Carol who can bring some more of her seminal work and theories into our findings. So I'll stop. Terrific. So Michal, if we can take down the screen sharing. Perfect, thank you. And Carol. Okay, here we go. Is that all right? Perfect, thank you. Okay, well, so it's a real pleasure to be here. And it's sort of a, you know, I was like, why am I being invited to do this? Because I honestly really know nothing about uh, the Jewish population and poverty in the United States. And I'm actually from Latin America and much more in expertise in poverty around the world than in the US, although I've been worried about the US for the past, uh, well, now almost 10 years and, and tracking ill being and deaths of despair. Yeah. But when I first presented my early findings quite a while ago, Mikhail said it really makes me think of Israel and why, um, you know, why a community matters so much. And so what I found initially, and it hasn't gone away and we keep finding the same thing. I mean, I've, I've obviously been working on different aspects of it, but was that despite the, being the most discriminated group in America and despite probably being the most disadvantaged group in America, low income African Americans were by far the the most optimistic population income race income cohort of the ones I studied and I, I, I studied Hispanics African Americans and whites for, because they were the three largest population groups in my data and this was a time of the riots in St. Louis I was in St. Louis you know shortly after that um, the times of the riots in Baltimore right near where I live um, and you know, it just seemed very puzzling. Were these findings real? When here was a group that was not only, you know, disadvantaged, but also at the moment, at the time, and now again, in you know, with the George Floyd um, movement and Black Lives Matter movement, um, in a in a very you know sort of tenuous time, and in, in a very 
anxiety producing time and yet they were incredibly optimistic about the future. And I looked back historically and I looked back at all sorts of things. I recoded my data and made, make sure I hadn't made a mistake. You know, how could poor African-Americans be so much more optimistic than any other group only to be followed by Hispanics? And as I'm from Latin America, um, it, you know, that seemed to make sense that Hispanics are always optimistic. And it, so I, it was very clear in the data, but I had to look outside for, for good explanations. And things like community aren't easy to measure in large end data very well, obviously. Um, and yet they matter a lot, as, as Mikhail mentioned. Um, and so what, what I found was both historically in sort of conversations in some of the other literature that I know less about, but learned from sort of sociological and um, historical and even anthropological anthropological literature was the incredible importance of culture and community in coping for African Americans. And I knew that from Latin America. In Latin America, everybody's your aunt or uncle, your tío or your tía, whether or not they actually are. That's just how you think about community. And those families and communities, I think, have been carried with Latin Americans as they migrate to the U.S., now, why are there so many Peruvians where I'm from in New Jersey of all places? Because there are lots of Peruvians. So you, you migrate to where there are lots of people like you, people that you might be related to that you, know, you have some cultural ties with. You know, Washington is, has a huge population of people from El Salvador, California, obviously Mexicans. But there's a, there's a story and it's in the migration literature of people moving to where they have networks and community when they move from other countries. I don't know enough about, um, you know, I think you've got a slightly different, uh, uh, obviously migration trajectory for Jews, both because of coming to the US during the Holocaust and then the, the real migration being to Israel, right? Where there's real communities. So there, there's a slight difference, but obviously the communities in the US seem to stick together in certain ways. And that seems to be very protective um, when, facing big challenges like COVID as Mikhail's shine, a finding shows so well. And then the other finding she has that she didn't mention as much, but I, I when, when I first looked at the COVID data and I worked on Mikhail's survey with her team to explore some of the well-being findings and then Mikhail and some of her team fielded a similar um, exercise in Israel and found that the the Orthodox communities, which were the poorest by far, also the least likely to get vaccinated, but the most optimistic during COVID. Um, so, you know, it really made me think a lot about uh, sort of, you know, the role of community and how, how it's protective of mental health um, and well being and all sorts of things. Um, very quickly, um, I've probably already used up a fair amount of time. Do I have like five more minutes? Okay, very Absolutely. quickly, let me yeah. just- No, please keep going. Let me tell you how we measure this stuff and the, and the approach we've, we've um, developed, some of the main findings. And then I wanna conclude both with a note of optimism, but also a note of caution. And the reason I mentioned vaccination was deliberate. Um, so going back to the, to the metrics, um, we do have now a robust science of measuring well-being. Um, countries around the world now having laughed at us when we first started this in economics, about two decades ago, people said, you, you work on what in economics? You, you use measures of happiness and well-being, and they sort of laughed us out of the room. Anyway, we persisted, and now it's actually become a mainstream field in economics. And I have to say I'm pretty proud of that um, because I think we provide new insights that standard economic models don't. We really bring in the human being, the human behavior, and human welfare into economic models, which includes econo you know, human psychology, which isn't always rational into some very static models of, of, that economists traditionally use, although they've definitely evolved. But even more important, I think now we have uh, countries who are using well-being as not just metrics in their statistics, which is great, it's the first step, but as real guidelines and priority setters for policy. Um, the UK, New Zealand, even Canada now is starting to think about well-being as a framing policy priorities. So instead of just focusing on economic progress, which is part of good wealth countries with high levels of well-being without out a doubt, um, but it's also a healthy society. You know, prosperity means more than just money. 
um, it's a uh, it's a society with good quality of life, good safety nets, good insurance, good communities, places to to commune, right? You know, green spaces, all, all sorts of things that make sense from the perspective of a development economist, which I, I am, um, and also not incredibly high levels of inequality like the U.S. has. And it's no surprise that the U.S. has fallen down 10 points in 10 years in the World Happiness Report. And it's really driven by inequality in well-being. And so we not only have, um, we not only have, you know, the most, one of the most unequal countries in the world, but we have huge inequalities in hope and happiness and stress among the rich and the poor. Um, and let me not get ahead of myself here. Very quickly, we measure three kinds of well being evaluative, which is a cognitive assessment of life satisfaction. It includes hope and optimism. Um, it's the most typical measure how satisfied are you with your life in general? We try and avoid happiness, even though it's a, the, the word that gets the most public attention and it's in a lot of covers, a lot of titles of my books because it sells well. Um, but for research purposes, it's it's rather ill-defined because you can be happy at the moment or you can be happy in general, which is more like life satisfaction. So we try and distinguish between the two. There's also hedonic well-being, which is mood and affect during daily activities. So are you smiling or stressed? People who are stressed a lot tend to have, you know, also have end up having a lot of health conditions. So hedonic spills into life course well-being in a way, but, but in the end, it's a daily measure. And then we also have started to defect uh, collect what I call Aristotle's uh, definition of well-being or happiness, which is meaning or purpose in life. Do you have high levels of meaning or purpose in life? So we typically use a total of four questions, evaluative, two hedonic questions, because you don't want to measure, you can't assume that smiling and angry are different ends of the same spectrum. They're very different emotions. So unlike life satisfaction and hedonic well-being, which we measure at like sort of a zero to 10 continuum, very low to very high, you can be angry and you can be smiling the same day very easily. They're very different emotional constructs and different you know, actual emotions. But in the end, it's four questions which take about two minutes to add to a national survey. So we really are not talking about a big, huge, expensive data exercise. Instead, a very simple one that allows us to take society's temperature all the time. It allows us to do work like Mikhail has done with the Jewish community, with sort of look at population cohorts and see, are they suffering? Are they thriving? What is it? What is it about the ones that are thriving that we can learn from? Um, and we can ask different questions like how does inequality affect well-being? Does, you know, does, does lack of hope really matter? It turns out, yes, it matters a lot. Um, and so the, the work I've been doing um, allows us to take a deep dive into these issues and particularly the patterns in deaths of despair in the US. So almost a million people have died of preventable deaths from suicide, alcohol, and drug overdose um, in the, since the year 2000. We actually managed to, with these kinds of deaths, deaths, reverse the progress we made in lowering our mortality due to cancer and heart disease, where we made a lot of progress. Instead, people are killing themselves in record numbers. It's really sad, middle-aged people. The more, um, the more perverse thing or the more surprising thing is it's really driven by low-income whites and you barely see minorities in this category. I don't know how, um, how the Jewish population fares in the deaths of despair category, but my guess is also quite a bit better than the, the, the low-income white. Um, Pop, you know, Anglo-Saxon population, um, particularly since we do find in our data that Jews do have generally high levels of optimism. Um, and then as Mikhail's work shows, the Orthodox communities probably the most. Um, okay, very quickly, uh, this is the, the equations we use. I don't think you wanna spend a lot of time on it in a, a very short webinar, but it's very important you know, to know that we're taking large end data and evaluating the well being of individual I at time T, it can be life satisfaction, it can be stress, it can be eudaimonic well being. Um, and then we collect for a lot of um, control variables, you know, depending on whether they're what, what's their gender, their income, their health, their race, et cetera. The most important thing to remember is that we're not asking people if certain things make them happy. 
were taking their levels of well-being and then looking at the kinds of determinants that we know about and those unusual ones that we don't know about and how that affects people's happiness. And, and so we find remarkably consistent patterns around the world in terms of people's life satisfaction, what determines it. And then we can explore a lot of things that barrier change more like the effects of COVID, right? How do, you, how do people cope with COVID, whatever. Um, very quickly, there's an age curve that makes you happy or unhappy depending where you are um on the age curve and it turns out this is latin america but it holds worldwide and there is indeed a u-shape there's a middle age dip in well-being has to do with aspirations aligning with reality double financial burdens of children and time burdens of children and maybe aging parents um it has to do with what psychologists call emotional wisdom people get emotionally more stable and wise as they age and then there's a selection bias because happier people live longer now, the, the sad thing is that the people dying of deaths of despair are doing it in exactly the middle of the U curve. And if you do, there's, a, there's actually a worldwide hump shape, reverse U, in stress, in antidepressant use, in suicide, and all sorts of bad things that mirror the trends in happiness, but in the reverse. So they go up in the middle ages. Um, and so very quickly, I mentioned these very paradoxical findings of the, you know, the the African American optimism, low income African American optimism versus uh, low income white pessimism. Those things are very much linked to objective health and high levels of reported pain, opioid addiction, and deaths of despair among the white uh, low income whites. And white, in, the, the other thing we have that our brilliant unemployment numbers or rates hide or mask, as well as do our you know, booming stock market rates, is 20% of prime age males had dropped out of the labor force altogether prior to COVID. This is not a COVID phenomenon. This isn't the great resignation. This is before COVID, 20% of our prime age male labor force was out of the labor force, not even looking for a job when we had a booming economy. So what explains that? Despair, unfortunately. Um, and it turns out, that um, the same white men who are, particularly the white men who are out of the labor force are the worst off group. They tend to have high levels of addiction. Um, they won't move. They tend to live in their parents' basements or census tracts. And so the, they're now on a scale, or the problem is now on a scale that it even affects our geographic mobility rates. So there's a lot of talk about why don't people move to jobs? Well, if they're in ill health or addicted to opioid, or have absolutely no aspirations for the future, they're not gonna move. And that doesn't even include a discussion about the kinds of skills they have, which is of course not adequate for the job tomorrow. Um, so then the last thing I'll talk about, and then I wanna um, turn back to the, the paradox of optimism, the, the sort of the, the things to look out for, is I've really spent a lot of time in the past year looking at low-income adults in none other than Missouri, where Wash U is from, and with the help of um, McCall and her team and other people at Wash U. And so I, want, I repeated some surveys I'd done in Peru where their low income adolescents have very high education aspirations. So 85% of our sample, which was living in a neighborhood that was half paved and half dirt roads and half had water and half had bought water from trucks, 85% of these 18 to 19 year olds said they wanted to go to college or grad school, which seems surprising, but we re-interviewed them three years later and most of our high aspiration kids still had high aspirations and were on track to meet their goals. So it was really remarkable. So I repeated the surveys in the US and got the same dynamics among minority kids. So African-American and um, Hispanic minorities are still very likely to believe that college is the only way or higher education in general is gonna get them ahead versus the white kids didn't want to go beyond high school. Again, this is low income whites. And one of the things that was most tragic is that their parents did not um, support their goals for higher education if they happened to have them. So the white kids' parents did not, actively did not want their kids to go to college. And if that seemed, and I don't think college is a solution for all kids. There's all kinds of skill training you can get to survive tomorrow's labor force. But the fact that these parents just didn't have any vision of the future for their kids and didn't pass that along to their kids is a tragedy in the making. I mean, the kids are going to be the next generation in despair. 
So I think we have to really understand these dynamics as we think about um, the take up of healthcare or moving to opportunity or et cetera. And desperate low income whites are unlikely to respond to new incentives. While minorities still face ma major barriers to doing so, they're very likely to respond. Now, I don't know how the low income Jewish population fits in, but my guess is looking at Mikhail's surveys and the coping skills and the resilience that they are very likely to take up opportunities if they have them, you know, to get ahead, that they're likely to support each other and their community is likely to support them. That's what I see in the patterns. I don't know. I hope you all have um, thoughts on this um, in terms of an audience. And then that's just the optimism gap, which is still pretty remarkable. Poor blacks are three times as likely to be higher up on an optimism scale than poor whites, which is the comparison or left out group. Um, and I think Jews are included in other race, which means or ethnicity, race and ethnicity is mixed in this slide, Hispanics also an ethnicity. And there you get both optimistic Hispanics and probably optimistic Jews. I don't know, either way, poor whites are, are in bad shape and it's showing up in lots of different ways, including in our politics, including in distrust in science. Okay, so let me, um, this is just the mortality rise in the US. I'm gonna skip the rest of this. These are changes in COVID. This is black, low, uh, low income black optimism. As you can see, they're the blue group and they are much more optimistic, less likely to get stressed throughout the COVID pandemic. This is work I did with Mikhail's team with her survey, the same survey she's been similar to what she's been using in the Jewish population survey. So here's the, here's the puzzle, right? I mean, I've t I, I think I, I'm one amount of time, but um, the puzzle is that the same optimistic Orthodox Jews and some of the low income black population are also the most resistant to vaccines. Now that may have to do with trust in the, you know, trust in the health system, all sorts of things. But it's it does suggest that in the end, while optimism is good, there are some things to work. Is is optimism sort of unrealistic? right? In the middle of a pandemic, not getting vaccinated is not the best thing to do. Um, and so, and I know when Mikhail did studies of vaccination in Israel, the Orthodox Jews kept coming out as the group that was least likely to get vaccinated. And Mikhail, please correct me if I'm wrong in, in my interpretation of your findings. But I do think that is something to think about. It gives us room for pause, despite the, the very, uh, I think, positive trends and message that communities are supportive that, that, that the Jewish community has helped a lot of people get through the COVID pandemic. Um, but I think that's still an outstanding question. So I'll stop there. Carol, thank you so much. I think there's just so much richness in what you, what you offered to us. Um, why don't we take down the screen sharing for just a moment. Um, and then I'd love to, you know, Michal, you have sort of, you straddle um, a number of different worlds. So, you know, it might be helpful just to start a little bit of a conversation um, about a whole bunch of different things, but which I'll, I'll leave to you. But the one, one I would love to make sure we get to is as we think about using things like a well-being set of metrics, how does that how does that help us? What does that get us that we're not able to get by looking um, at the traditional metrics um, of of poverty and um, and in particular sort of the community aspect to that? But Michal, what are what are your thoughts? What are your questions and reactions? I will leave it to the expert. Like I, I have my thought, but I think Carol is by far the expert on well being and both the theories about that. So you know, I will I will save it for her. Okay. Good. Carol, do you want to answer that one? And then I will, then we'll sort of come back to sort of just the, Michal, your overall reactions. Sure. Um, it, it is that what, what the well being stuff does is it exposes paradox, including parado paradoxes, including paradoxes in human behavior. Um, it exposes the fact that money doesn't make people happy necessarily, as economic models assume, at least that it's not a linear relationship. Of course, being destitute is terrible for well being. But after a certain level of income, which varies depending on the culture and the society, people really care much more about things like good health and, and creativity and education and freedom, all sorts of things um, that come in that, that are very much a part of human existence, but complexify very simple models of human behavior. So the well-being um, 
stuff exposes sometimes paradoxes. So one of the things, the, pro, the, the optimism paradox is something I obviously think about and work on a lot, which is why I raised the question about vaccination and Orthodox Jews, but there are many other ways to pose the question. For example, one of the things I wanted to make sure with the African-American findings was that it wasn't just religion driving the findings. Nothing against religion, but it's just a very different kind of finding if it's, it's, if it's a belief that God will take care of it versus um, separate from that. But what I found with my optimistic African-American respondents, the low-income ones, was one, they did better over time. So their optimism wasn't some sort of fantasy. And when you were asked them about their financial situation or the city that they lived in, they were very realistic, right? They reported their financial situation to be worse than the average or than other people like them. They, um, they reported their city to be a mess, even though they wanted to make it better. Um, there are other, there've been some other tests of that finding to just make sure you don't have a Pollyanna finding, right? And that's a little bit why I threw that out to get some views on what's going on with the Orthodox Jewish community. So our, our findings control for religion, not again, not that religion is a, a bad thing, but it, I wanna make sure the optimism is, is separate from that and not, and there are aspects about community and religion that are unobservable and not, you know, not gonna be in the, in the data, right? That we can't control for and probably have something to do with religion, but at the least I wanna get a handle if it's something that's driven by community or if whether it's driven by, um, whether it really is driven by religious identity. Mm -hmm. Great. Michal, please go ahead. No, I will, I will just add that it's also, as um, Carol said, um, it's before in the presentation, it can predict behavior and how a community behave. And if there are kind of, there is very high sense of well being and connection, that, that as you see, they, they help them like, it's helped them um, weather this pandemic, it's helped them weather a storm, they are there for each other, they have a higher level of mental health even in the midst of the pandemic, they have a, a higher level of committees. So to me, what this finding is also when we think about the Jewish community and when we're measuring well-being, and and you know it's it's kind of like it's helped us for me. I use that data to see how connection, his connectivity, and the sense of community and togetherness of the Jewish community was connected to well-being. And well-being is such a big protective factor on health, on mental health, on so many other factors. And if we understand how we can increase the well-being of our community, that we can have you know, better outcomes for the community. So I think we always need to measure well-being and understand it because that's kind of the measure of how our community is doing and how we can improve the community and where should we interfere. And to me, again, like 44% who said, they are not connected, who don't have someone they connect, that, that's definitely affecting their well-being. That's for a Jewish founder network, that for me will be a place, one of the places for intervention, for example. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. So um, I'd like to open it up to comments and questions from the audience. Um, there's at least one in here um, to, that we haven't yet addressed, although we've addressed some of the other ones. Um, it says the Orthodox community has a reputation for being deeply connected, including many small and large charities specific to the community. What are some of the disconnects? The, the Orthodox have... Um... Can you repeat that? Sorry, I lost that. It's kind of sorry. Sure. No, it's um, that the Orthodox community has a reputation for being deeply connected, um, specific, including charities specific to the community. So um, where are the disconnects? So even among them, we see, we don't know exactly if it's the ultra-Orthodox, so like the survey was done for the old Jewish community. So we don't know. I guess we can do additional analysis and see if it's the ultra-Orthodox who are not connected or it's other, you know, because we have secular, we have regular Jew, we have all of them, but it might be that even among the ultra orthodox, there are still people who responded that they're feeling not connected. That's something that we clearly can um, do a further analysis and see if it, it's really different by the level of religiousity. If it's like among Jewish, it's different by the level of religiousity and ultra orthodox are more. Mm -hmm. 
Can I ask a question that may inform how you uh, go forward with your study? The, I mean, the, the ultra-Orthodox, maybe they're connected to each other, but less connected to the general community. Is that, and they're sort of their own, their own, are they their, their own conclave or are they, do they tend to be very insular? Again, I really don't know. I'm just curious if it's a kind of, um, like when you think about Mark Granovetter, if it's weak ties or strong ties, do they have a lot of strong ties just among themselves and then they sort of stay away from the rest? That, that's definitely something we can measure. Yeah. Good. And so there's another question in here, which is, I think, um, potentially related, Carol, to your question, which is, what are the things that we can do to increase connectivity? Um, there's obviously been so much conversation about people who are not necessarily already connected to the Jewish community or Jewish organizations. And Michal, you alluded to this in your, um, in your remarks. But I'm wondering if there are things um, either from a narrative point of view or from kind of a, an action funding point of view um, to increase connectivity to get some of these effects. Um, so either one of you might, might have ideas on that. I'm happy to, to get us started. So, you know, I will, I will give you two observations. So, so first I will, I'll say something very personal. When I moved to the US um, to pursue my PhD, I started going to the synagogue. Now in Israel, I never went to the synagogue only in high holidays because I'm coming from a secular house and it just, you know, seculars don't go on a regular basis to the synagogue. And when I moved to the US, there was so much that the synagogue offered than other, not the, what I was thinking always as the synagogue, but, you know, so many kind of lectures and things for the, our young kids and, Israeli school within the synagogue and it kind of brings us together. It's really connected the whole like community together. And we were like, it was an Orthodox synagogue, but there were people from all over. There was Israeli, there were uh, unreligious, there were all Orthodox, they were all got together and because they were, and to become like, I will be there almost like once a week. It's become something even because it offered a lot of variety and different things for me. And I found there again, the community that I was looking for. Uh, I, I think we, we, to bring more people to the Jewish community, you need to really um, be innovative and think about different offering and, and to a lot of different ages and kind of meet them where they are and where, what are their interests. Uh, another example I can throw is the um, IAC, the um, Israeli American Council, that they kind of relatively a new organization, I believe maybe 10 years or something like that, a little bit longer, but they've grown from being such a small organization to be all over, really active and engaging everyone. And there are uh, programs there from young mothers with their babies to uh, Israeli kids to learn um, English everywhere, to send leaders to Israel, to um, help develop leaders, to help, you know, uh, do entrepreneurship for a youth to like really connect you with a lot, a lot of innovation and really listen to the community, what they need. Like maybe how can we get to more people? You maybe starting with a survey and really understanding what, what will work for them. Mm -hmm. Especially after COVID, I feel like everyone will be wanting. Once that will be gone, finally, I think we all will really want to be connected and everyone will need to be connected. Carol, any thoughts on that? Well, it's a huge question. So, I mean, it's, I think what Mikhail mentions are, are the, the right strategies. The question is, do they pull people from outside the community in, right? How do you commu create community among people who don't have one? So you have in Israel um, and among the Jewish community, you have a shared identity. And so that makes it easy to pull people with the same identity in. And I think the African-American community has something similar. The Latin American community has something similar. Um, you know, when you think about groups like the desperate low-income whites who've had a trajectory and a narrative for years of hard work gets you ahead. It's all about individual work ethic. It's all about the American dream. Um, who are not great at having collective support mechanisms, right? There's sort of a... Um, you don't fall back on safety nets. You don't fall back. There's very much, you know, very small family. How do you, how do you come up with um, 
you know, community building measures that you can transfer from one community to the other if the populations have a very different narrative and a very different identity. And I'm afraid I don't know the answer. If I did, I could do a lot to solve the problem of despair because I think that is the problem. I think that's one of the problems is people have lost touch with the narrative for how to move forward and hope for the future, which these communities that we're talking about have a lot of, they have a lot of hope, they have a lot of community. How do you provide both hope and community to people, to places and populations that don't have any? And I think it is, um, it, it's a big challenge. It, it, I think the kinds of the mechanisms that Mikhail is saying, just reaching out to people that are lonely and desperate with some sort of ties, with some sort of activity that pulls them in to some sort of community. You know, it's hard to imagine, you know, Midwestern evangelicals going to an African-American Baptist church ceremony, right? That's not going to happen. But there are things that I think we can learn from the very community oriented African-American churches, for example, that a lot of low income whites don't have. How we transfer the message, how we pull pe people in, I, I really, I don't know yet. And it's something I'm thinking about a lot and working a lot, look forward to Macau's next surveys. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one wonderful example we have in the US, there are many that we're trying to build upon and learn from, but one is through the kids. Right, so kids don't care about color. They don't care about religion. Mm -hmm. And so there's an example um, of a program that's now been duplicated around the US called Portland Community Squash, where they bring kids in to play sports and do arts. And if they join the program seriously, they help, they pay for their college. So they raise a lot of money. And then they pull the parents of the community in through the kids, through the kids' sports events, and they have separate events for the parents, but then it's broken down a lot of barriers. And if you think about Portland, Maine, it's a very white traditional community and in comes Somali refugees and all sorts of other immigrants and to, you know, who are very poor and very isolated. And it turns out those new population groups, but giving them a community and pulling then the, the, the more traditional whites in the community into that effort, they were really able to make some integration uh, progress, but also really pull the community together. Um, and I don't wanna be a Pollyanna about it. It's not always easy, but it seems as I saw Susan Seely in the chat again saying, yes, the kids. And I, I think you're right. I think this is, you know, kids are colorblind and religion blind and bias blind until they're taught to not be, right? So I think it's, uh, I think that is one approach. Yeah, just and to- Go on, please. Sorry. And then the other thing that the UK has done a lot of to combat loneliness, which is a very strong link to depression, is to get isolated older people who are out of the labor force into some sort of community activity. It can be volunteering together. It can be group walks in green spaces. It can be new arts programs, right? You're not trying to produce income generating activities at that point, but you're just trying to get people to reconnect something that, as Mikhail says, we were going to need even more after COVID and we're going to want even more. But again, these are actually pretty simple things. The, the question is, how do you get them to work across groups? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. I just want to pull out one other thing from the chat. There were lots of examples that were, not, there were children, but also um, things like, and I'll just read it, recreation, card games, um, uh, cooking, baking, singing, childcare. So sort of things that um, are sort of more general community building activities um, that don't require a particular level of observance or a particular um, set of uh, sort of religious, have necessarily have religious overtones, although many of those can, cooking, baking um, can happen um, in, a, in a religious context as well. So we are almost at the top of the hour. Um, I just want to say thank you to each of you. I want to give Give you each sort of uh, opportunity to have the last word. Um, and, you know, again, the the audience that we're talking to is primarily people who are funders um, and CEOs of, you know, for example, Jewish Family um, and Children's Services type agencies. So I'm curious if you can kind of take all of the things that you've um, told us today um, in terms of any big takeaway lessons um, that would be, I'd love to, I'd love to hear them. So um, Carol, if we can start with you and then Michal, um, that would be wonderful. Well, I think that, I think 
what combining the two of us on the same panel shows. And I, I've certainly learned just listening to some of my Kyle's newest findings, which I didn't know all about. I'd seen the, the ones in Israel is that there's, there's a lot to learn about optimism and resilience. It's incredibly important. And I think it's recognized to be even more so now with the, as horrible as the COVID experience has been, I think it's brought to the fore of you know, government policy that we need to worry about our society as well as economic progress. And that some of the lessons are transferable across groups. Um, and I think and hope that I can continue to learn and from Mikhail's new studies um, in ways that help me think through, you know, what to do about desperation in the US more generally. Um, and it is a problem that's starting to butt up in, in many industrialized countries where the working class is just in decline. And the kinds of jobs that they have are going away. And so we, we have deaths of despair showing up in some European countries as well. Mm. Good, thank you, Carol. And Michal? Yeah, so yeah, thank you again for the opportunity to present. I think what I'm, you know, I've learned that it, it's really clear that everyone was suffering during COVID, but it's also sh shown that the strengths of the Jewish community to keep um, taking care of their, of, of their community and to be resilient for, for, the, for, for many of them. Um, so that's, I think that's also, I want to congratulate you in that opportunity because I think many people with this webinar are kind of at the front of this work and front of like helping the, you know, more vulnerable communities among the Jewish community working for that. And I think um, you have accomplished a lot. So congratulations and, and great job. You, you really have a, a strong uh, community. Uh, and again, as I said it several times, there are still people who are left out. There are still people who are more, more vulnerable. Uh, Orthodox Jew for some things, you know, young adult, parents of young kids or of all other kids that were in, uh, you know, before COVID and younger that have higher like material hardships. So there's still work to do. And uh, I'm sure you will be there to support everyone. Good. Thank you so much to both of you. We're so grateful to have you. Um, and again, this is a little bit of a different format to bring data um, from kind of adjacent areas into the conversation about Jewish poverty. And I've gained so much um, about just different ways to think about things. So thanks to both of you. Um, so let me turn it back to Tamar to, um, to sing us out. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan, for moderating. And thank you, Carol and Michal, for sharing your your wisdom and your um, and all that data and give us all a lot to to think about and to wonder about and to see how we can use that to, to help it in the best way and to create the most impact. So thank you so much again for your partnership with this program, and we have, and thank you for everybody that participated and we look forward to learning with you again soon. Have a great day, everybody. Stay well. <laughs>